Good day to you. God bless you. Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study. Praise God. We're ready to go again. Um, another special. I have one point that I wish to make in this lecture. It's going to be pulling primarily from the book of Jude. But I have one point, and I'll explain it as we come to it. I just thank our Father for a great nation, for the rights, the freedoms we have to teach His Word, to teach His truth. And I'm so proud of our neighbors, both to the north and the south, from Newfoundland to Brazil, that enjoy and study with us. We just thank our Father in Yahshua's precious name. Amen. We will be, I might make a, a short announcement before we begin. On the next four lectures, beginning Monday, um, if this happens to be October the 9th, where you're at, and not a rerun, but live, we're going to be showing, for the benefit of those people that receive us via television station, not satellite, but via television, they only receive us one hour a day. And we've had a tremendous amount of questions on Genesis, therefore we will be showing the first four lectures from the book of Genesis on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. I feel led to do this, and yours truly is going to take a little vacation, a short one, and, uh, I, but I want all of you to study. Um, I'll be returning the night of the 16th. We will take communion at that time. I'm looking forward to that. I hope all of you are. You have the ingredients present on that evening. We're just going to have a great time together. And then the following Monday, we're going to start either the book of Hebrews or the book of Romans, one or the other. You be praying about it. We'll pick it up from there. Okay, let's get right into it. I have one point I wish to make from this book of Jude. We've been through it many times, but we're going to go through it again and emphasize how you must control evil spirits, demons, for there is only one way you can. Of course, everyone immediately says, in the name of Jesus. Yes, in part. But we, as Christians, are all guilty, at one time or the other, of making a grave error in doing that. Let's make sure we learn from our Father's Word, His way, in, ha in handling the negative forces that will become more prominent as days march on toward that day, the day, our Father's Day. Jude uh, is the Greek form of Judas, or even from the Hebrew Judah, meaning praised, if you would. Um, a very interesting, a very short book with only one chapter. Let's just get right into it, if we may. Verse 1, Jude, the servant of Jesus Christ, and brother of James, to them that are sanctified by God the Father. To them that are already called out. Do you understand who this is written to? Those that are already called out and preserved. Are you with me? Preserved in Jesus Christ and called. In other words, His elect. Written directly and specifically to the elect. Meaning sharpen up. Get on that level. Verse 2. Mercy unto you and peace and love be multiplied. I'd like for you to make a note of um, Matthew 13, 55. In this, uh, you will find this was, in fact, James was the brother of Jesus, or a half-brother. And being a half-brother, of course, that makes this one uh, Jude, also a half-brother to Jesus Christ. Three, beloved, now you sharpen up and you listen to me. Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you, I was contemplating this. I was thinking about it um, to you of the common salvation. I was just going to write you a little old simple message of the common salvation. It, in the Greek, changed that to but, if you would. But was needful. I realized it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that ye should earnestly contend. That means in the Greek also to defend for the faith, to contend for that faith. I'm, really, this is a little stronger in the Greek. He said, I'm forced to write you about this. Absolutely forced. I'd like to write a few sweet sayings to you on common salvation, but I am forced to write to you about your contention 
to hang on to that faith uh, which was once delivered unto the saints. Verse 4, the reason there is danger. For there are certain men crept in unawares who were before of old ordained. Now in the Greek that means from before. Now you that are scholars, you know we're talking about the world that was even through that. That fell even in the world that was, that turned God's mighty creation into the abomination that it was in following Satan, bringing about the downfall of that first earth age. Who were before of old ordained. That means predestined to this condemnation. They were judged there. Ungodly men. Turning the grace of our God or changing the grace of our God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. Remember those little old demons in the book of Mark when Jesus walked along and this poor old boy is possessed? Eaten up with them, you might say. It wasn't a disease because they spoke to him. They said, O thou mighty son of David! They knew he was the son of the living God. They knew who he was. For they have remembrance of that time. And you have, therefore, evil spirits. Now, what are we talking about here? We're not talking about evil spirits here. The reason I'm drawing and expanding upon this is I want you for once and all to get it straight in your mind, the difference between fallen angels, evil spirits, and the devil. You're talking about three different things. Evil, uh, like the little word demons, actually you're not going to find it written in the Greek manuscripts. It's evil spirits. That's what's written there. Evil spirits. Now, naturally, Diablo, Satan, the devil, is written singular, for he is. But the evil spirits are entities in the presence of the, in the negative of the Holy Spirit, that is to say, the negative of that positive, if, if that'll make it clear for you. As the Holy Spirit is able to touch you, so can an evil spirit. But we're talking here about fallen angels. The same fallen angels that left their place of habitation when they saw the daughters that God had created in creating and forming Adam's helpmate as well as other daughters of other peoples. But Satan specifically was interested in this daughter because he knew that Christ, this same Lord Jesus Christ, would come through that woman. That's why it is written, Eve would be the mother of all living. Not because she was the mother of all peoples, but because through her, her offspring, her daughters, would come the Lord Jesus Christ and you're either in Him or you're not living when you look at time in God's frame, time frame. You're just not there. So these were ungodly men, angels, whatever you want to call them, entities, souls, that refused to follow God's plan but departed that first lot. What Jude's going to do, beloved, is to tell you how to deal with these people, how to contend with them whether it be in the form of the evil spirit, an actual Nephilim, Nephilim, which is to say fallen angel, or the devil himself. Verse 5. I will therefore put you in remembrance. I'm going to call this back to your mind. Though you once knew this, how that the Lord, having saved the people out of Egypt, out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed them that believed not. In other words, he's showing you the severity of our own father. Hey, they crossed the Red Sea. They were given the gift. They built that idol. And in, and in um, pure, uh, not ignorance, purely knowing the power of the living God wanted an idol. God destroyed many of them. Had Moses probably not interceded, there had not interceded, there's no telling how many he would have destroyed. God doesn't like it, friend. 
He doesn't like it when his children whore after some other religion and our belief, especially if they know better. Because those people had observed the power of Almighty God opening the very sea for them. They didn't have to have faith to know that. They had witnessed it. It makes a difference. You today, or we today, are really fortunate that our faith, in many cases, some of you have been taken there, and you know what I'm talking about. For you, it's not a matter of faith. You know the facts. But most have not seen, and their faith is in the hope of that promise. And that's why God loves them so much. But what he's saying here, what Jude is telling you, is our Father is very severe when it comes to unfaithfulness. Verse 6. Again, understand the severity of unfaithfulness of which I speak. Not just being unfaithful because of laziness or ignorance, but unfaithful to Satan and his children themselves. Verse 6. And the angels which kept not their first estate, those angels that would not remain in paradise with Almighty God until it was time for that soul which possessed them to be born of woman, they rather looked down and observed woman and took her for a play pretty or a playmate, seduced her, and children were born. And they were called gibar in the Hebrew tongue, which is to say giants. They left their first estate, but left their own habitation he hath reserved, our Father hath reserved in everlasting chains under darkness unto the judgment of the great day. In other words, they're already judged because they would not follow God's plan. They haven't got a prayer. There's no way that they could pray to the Lord Jesus Christ and find deliverance. For in the angelic body, with full knowledge of what they were doing, they committed an unpardonable sin. They turned their back upon the Hurak, the spirit that moved upon the waters that created, that formed, when they knew better. There is a difference, and it's a very serious thought. Those of you that have eyes to see or ears to hear, you want to be very careful when you come to knowledge. I'm not trying to frighten anyone, and I don't want you to feel an ill at ease. But I want you to know one thing. I want you to know how to handle evil spirits, call them devils if you like, plural, or the Satan. <clears throat> Let's talk a moment. What is one of Satan's names in Hebrew? It's adversary. In Greek also, adversary. Do you know what an adversary is? That's someone that's arguing or accusing, making accusations. God doesn't like that. He doesn't like argumentative people. Friend, you either trust him and believe in him, and once he has spoken, there have been occasions when God allowed, well, look at Joshua, for example. Oh, Lord, I'm going to take this little old skin and lay it out here, or let the dew fall away from it. And, oh, Lord, God, forgive me, but let the dew fall on it. I want to be sure. He has entertained uh, our backwardness, our, our human nature. I think he understands that. He knows we're all weak, especially without him. He knows the assurance that we need, but he also knows when you come to knowledge that you know a truth and have received it and accepted it. But what he's talking about here are those fallen angels that left paradise how, well, how would they leave, you might ask? It's really quite simple. Look at the vehicle God himself came to earth in, in the book of Ezekiel. It is drawn out in detail. Well, are all of them good vehicles? No, not if, not if angels fallen are operating those things. I'm not talking about UFOs. God, they're not unidentified to Almighty God or Satan either. They know very well what they are. Seven. Even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh. Do you know what this strange flesh is? It means flesh of your own gender, which it means homosexuality. 
and are set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. God killed them. God destroyed them. He let Job and his family, even with the exception of his own wife, which he turned to a pillow of salt when she looked back upon that sin and perversion that was in those cities. Understand, my dear one, what Jude is trying to tell you, other than telling you a story of fallen angels, he's making a point to you that our Father can be very unforgiving past a certain point. And there is one thing that drives him to it, and that's the point I wish to make tonight. What is that one thing that drives our Father to that point of whoo, destruction? It's a good thing to know. Well, <laughs> well, uh, would God do that? He did. Not only would He do it, He did it. It is written in the remains of the cities can still be found with the fire that took place there. Not only in those cities, but the surrounding cities. He didn't need an atomic weapon to accomplish it. I want you to make a note of 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 1 through 6, which fortify this same teaching of Jude. I'm going to turn there in a moment to fortify one point I wish to make. 8. Likewise also these filthy dreamers defile the flesh. Despise dominion. Do you know what dominion is? Dominion is part of the word of kingdom. A king must have a dominion before you have a kingdom. It's the two words placed together. Lordship. They would not accept his lordship and speak evil of dignities. They take the very glories, even the virgin birth, and speak foul of it. Listen, God doesn't like it. But what Jude wants you to know is you don't have to put up with it. He's telling you line by line what these filthy creatures do and how the evil spirits move on some even in the flesh and cause them to participate in like uh, things. But what Jude wants you to know, you do not have to put up with it. The next verse gives you the point, verse 9. Yet Michael, the archangel, not one of these fallen things, not one of these filthy creatures of Satan. Oh, God created them. I don't want, I, I, let's not mislead anyone, but they were, I call them of Satan because they, lo, they loved him, worshipped the very ground he walked on, but not our Father. But Michael, our archangel, the angel of Israel, David, uh, David Daniel chapter 12, verse 1, documentation. The archangel, when contending with the devil, he disputed about the body of Moses. In other words, Michael is con was confronted by the devil, the old adversary himself, about Moses' body. I want you to understand what's happening. He's arguing about it. Being, even if you would, a scripture lawyer, standing there debating this evil trot from the very word of God, debating, arguing, contending, complaining, accusing, making accusation. Well, why Moses? Because Moses was the one that led the people to the promised land, yet falling short, was replaced by Joshua. In the book of Zechariah, what is it in chapter 3, makes it very clear that, that Satan himself um, contended with Joshua, the replacement of Moses. Uh, and is it not written in Matthew 23 that the scribes and the Pharisees, the Kenites, the play actors, sit in the seat of Moses? That's why they wanted his body, that that was left, all that was left, the seed that would go into the promised land. But he disputing about the body of Moses does not bring against him a riling accusation. Now, you get this now. Michael didn't rear back and bring a rolling um, accusation in return fire to Satan. Didn't argue with him, if you want me to put it plainer yet. Michael didn't take or didn't waste the time to argue with the devil. What did he do? But said, The Lord rebuked thee. 
don't you dare take time to argue with a demon, an evil spirit, or the devil. You tell them where to go. That's the point. And that's the lesson. Because I'm going to tell you something. There is not an accuser in human flesh that is able to win in a debate against Satan. Now, now, don't some of you uh, weak-minded Christians that didn't listen to the words go jumping off the deep end. I said flesh. A flesh man cannot win an argument. You must handle it in the exact example that Jesus Christ handled it as an example unto you. He did not contend but did a little teaching in the scriptures. But at the point he was ready, he simply said, Get behind thee, Satan! And voided his privileges upon this earth at that time. In other words, don't argue with the demon. You're going to lose if you do. I'll tell you why. As long as you have Christ in you, it's not the flesh only. Flesh is weak. If you have Christ in you, of course, you have power to order Satan. But if you begin to deal with evil spirits, you're entertaining them. Did, did you hear me? If you argue with them, you're entertaining them. You know, I was working with a man that was possessed. Where he is this night, I know not. That last account, he was in Canada. But he is, I have confronted him on occasion. And I made it clear to him that I had a gift if he wanted it, for it was very obvious that he was possessed to the nth degree. And in his last call from Canada, when I spoke to him, I called him by name and I said, you know, you know I have a gift here. And you know that I can rid you of that that is in your shadow. He said, you mean the demons? I mean the evil spirits. And he said, I, I know they're there, but I don't want them to go. And I said, why would you not want them to go? He said, because, Pastor Murray, there are many times they make more sense than you do. Did you hear me? He said, Pastor Murray, there are many times they make more sense than you do. You see, in his arguing with them, and they're making accusations, they won him over. How many of you know of a certainty that when your conscience allows doubt to come in, that it's not your conscience alone? That a negative thought is not a negative spirit? How much experience have you had? And I'm not trying to frighten anyone, and there's not a demon behind every bush. When you face the reality, you will know it. The whole point is this. You don't argue with them. You simply... Tell them, the Lord rebuke thee. You don't rebuke them because you don't have the power, friend. The Lord rebuke thee. I rebuke thee in the name of the Lord. Be gone back where you came from. That's where they left. Send them back. You see, the whole point that God wants you to realize is don't argue with me and don't argue with Satan. If I parted the Red Sea, if I brought you out and you turned back to an idol, then I destroyed them with fire. But don't you mess with these things that I have already placed the curse on and they're condemned to death. As a matter of fact, you have heard me give you the term in the Hebrew, the Rephim, which means death. They are dead. They are death. And when you argue with them, you're arguing with dead itself and there is no winner. Turn, turn with me back to the book of uh, Peter. Let's go to 2 Peter, that great chapter just before Peter so eloquently taught of, of the three world ages. Peter, in this second chapter, is speaking of these same, same angels, those that fell. Verse 4, if you'll catch it, For God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell, and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment. He's gonna, they're already judged, though, but they wait until that day. Skip on if you would. Well, let's go to the tenth. But chiefly, them that walk after the flesh in the lust, cleanliness, and despise government. That is to say that uh, despise a government God has ordained. 
presumptuous are they, self-willed. They are not afraid to speak evil of dignities. That is to say of our Father's power and His grace. They want to argue. That's what, that's what speaking um, evil of dignities has to do. Eleven, absorb it. Sharpen up for me. Whereas angels, which are greater, the word greater, in power and might, bring not riling accusations. They don't argue against them before the Lord. Don't argue. Just tell them to go. You see, the whole point is this, beloved. You don't have to. You don't have to put up with it. If you put up with it, it's your own fault. Because you have the power in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, to put that negative stuff out of your life. That's the whole point in this book of Jude, is to teach our people to use the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ to contend, and I told you to protect the faith that we have from Almighty God. Don't, if you ever feel your faith weakening, what's causing it? Now, let's, the, probably your own weakness. Don't argue with anything evil. Put it away from you. Order it out in the power of the name. Now, now think for a moment what has been said here. Michael, the archangel himself, and he has a great deal more power than you. He didn't argue with the devil. Not over Moses' body or anything else. He told him where to go. And that's what you must do also when you're confronted. Verse 10. I, now, let me, let me insert quickly. I'm not talking about the time you're delivered up before Antichrist. You're not to premeditate. I'm talking about my friend today and tomorrow. And every day up until that time, you will premeditate. You will know what you're going to tell something evil if it comes in your life. You're going to order it out. You're not going to take time to argue with them or let them argue with you mentally. Verse 10. And these speak evil of those things which they know not. That's to say Christ's deity. They don't know anything about it. But what they know naturally as brute beast in those things, they corrupt themselves. Woe unto them, for they have gone the way of Cain. What did Cain, the very son of Satan, the very seduction of Eve, as it is well written, in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 2 and 3, the word beguiled uh, in the Greek, expatio, which is to say wholly seduced. The way of Cain was to fulfill his father's work against God. Argue, 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 argue. And ran greedily after the era of Balaam for reward idol worship, Baal worship, Babel, and perished in the gainsayings of Kori. Kori, the Greek form of Korah. Do you know who Korah was? Korah was a cousin to Moses and to Aaron. He wanted to be a full priest. He said, well, I want to be a big preacher. I don't, I don't want to take a back seat back here behind Aaron and Moses. Uh, I am a cousin and I deserve the same right of the priesthood. I want to be a super preacher. And he led astray many with false teachings, but primarily disobeying Almighty God. Do you know what happened to him? God, God he, he placed this here in this book of Jude so that you would use it as an example. It wasn't man that destroyed Korah. God himself, through the force of an earthquake, destroyed his whole band of misfits, false priests, false teachers. It will be done our Father's way, and if anything evil and or satanic approaches your life, you don't argue with it. You don't give it the time of day. You only tell it where to go. That way you will not be tempted, and I assure you, they will most likely not be back. They don't like to play or or argue with you because you hurt them. Keep it that way. Do, do you understand? That's the point I wish to make. Verse 12. You know why? Listen to this description. 
They are spots in your feasts of charity. When they feast with you, they want to call themselves preachers, friend. Christian. Feeding themselves without fear. They don't, they're not afraid of God's wrath. God just told you and reminded you what he has pronounced upon Cain, Balaam, and Korah. An earthquake consumed Korah. They better have a little respect for him. Clouds they are without water carried away of winds. Trees whose fruit withereth. You know what tree he's talking about? I shouldn't have to remind you. Christ cursed the fig tree. Whereby that particular symbol of the very fig leaves that made the apron that was sown and placed over Adam and Eve to hide their sin with Satan begins the parable of the fig tree. The thing that happened in the fig grove, what was it? Well, you're going to find out in the next four lectures. But that's why the tree withereth. Without fruit, remember Christ, never to produce fruit again. Twice dead, plucked up by the roots. Do you know what that means? Not only has the... I want, I want to explain some about this verse so you catch fully what God... In the first place, these... Spots are hidden rocks, they are. Hidden rocks has a twofold meaning that your father wants you to grasp. Rocks, in as much as they are not of our rock, our rock is not their rock. But hidden rock, do you know what a hidden rock does to the keel of a boat, a ship? All right? That's what they'll do to you. That's what God wants you to know. You let them into your celebrations, your feasts, your studies and argue with them, they will literally rip the keel out of your church. And how few Christians today even know that Kenites exist. That is to say, Cain, Corey, and Balaam. They don't. That's why they're called hidden spots. Raging waves of the sea foaming out their own shame. Wandering stars, fallen angels, you understand? To whom the, is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. Don't argue with them. Tell them where to go. That's your defense, not yourself. You're not that good, nor am I that good. Our defense is in the power in the name of Yeshua Messiah, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Don't argue with them, not even Michael would. Then who are you? Get rid of them. All right? That's the one point that made. God bless you. Listen a moment, won't you please?